Welcome everybody. I am Pastor Jack with my wife Joyce and we are glad to be with you today. And we, want, we hope all of you had a great Thanksgiving weekend. But listen, we've got a message that's going to get you all fired up and you're going to thank God after hearing it. And it's a message about never giving in in your life. You know, it's something that you have to be that way as a Christian. You can't give in to the pressure. You've got to press through to God's best. Yeah, and that's not, it. That's not always easy. Um, well, I sure know that one. But, you know, I, sometimes I get to the point when I know it's God's will and it seems like all everything else is saying it's not. You know, I, I'll even just to the point where I don't want the devil to win. You know, so when you're in that, that almost desperate situation, you know, just claim the name of Jesus and stand firm you know, it, it's so rewarding when you pass through that, whatever that, that um, issue in life, that season in life that's, that's causing you doubt and unbelief and weariness, you know, that there is light at the end of that mess, you know, and that light goes with you as Jesus goes with you, but you have to stand strong in His Word. All right, get ready right now as we get into this message, never give in, never give in because God has something great for you in your life. Get your Bibles open and get your ears open to hear from God. God will help you today. This morning I want to minister to you on the topic that I've called Never Give In. Never give in to those voices of opposition that all of us have faced in our lives. I learned from the very get-go that the devil has many voices and many of those voices are in opposition to what God wants you to do or accomplish in your life. And you have to be spiritual enough that you never give in to the voices that you hear that sometimes come from people, sometimes come from circumstances, sometimes come from your feelings. That would be in opposition to God's Word. I remember from the very beginning it's been like that since Joyce and I gave our life to Jesus I remember when the Lord first asked us to go to Rainbow Bible Training Center in Tulsa. We said, all right, we're going to go. And originally what we were going to do is, I lived on six acres, is, uh, and we had a mobile home on there that we were going to rent it out and then just go to, buy, go to school. And uh, until the bank told me that I couldn't do that. I said, why can't I do it? He says, because it's a mobile home. You know, I, it's not something permanent. And I said, what do you think? They're going to hook up to it and take it away? He said, well, that's the reason why you can't rent it. I said, the wheels are not on it. It's bolted down to a, to a slab. But nevertheless, they wouldn't do it. You know how banks are. And, uh, but the Lord moved on my parents' heart, and they bought the place. So we went. But from the very beginning, there was always this opposition, this voice that says you can't do it. I remember when we were going to build this building. We didn't have enough money to build this building. And we, you know, we're, you know we need more money. And you go to the bank and you, you tell them we need more money. And they laugh at you because you don't have any equity. You don't have any, enough cash to make it happen. See, banks won't loan you money unless they can get it back out of you after they loan it to you. Amen? Even though we had excellent credit, no one would do it. And uh, so the voice said, no, there's no way you can do this. Maybe, maybe minister another 20 years, you'll get enough money that you'll be able to do it. But God moved the hearts on several of the board members that co-signed for the loan. I co-signed for it. Put everything on the line so that we could build this building. There's always a voice that says you can't do it. And I'm here to tell you that God wants you to deliver you from it, but you cannot give in to it in your life. You cannot give in to the voices that say you can't make it, the voices that say that you won't be that better person, the voices that say you'll never have the family that you desire. You've got to never give in to it in your life. And that's what the Lord has instructed me today to, to minister to you. And I'm going to minister to you. So I want you, if you will, let's look at a familiar story over in 1 Samuel. It's a story of King David who got in a very t terrible situation where there was the voice of guilt that hit him. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? And I want to show you how he overcame. Look at this. Now it happened that when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, 
The Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag attacked at Ziklag and burned it with fire. And they had taken captives, the women and those who were there, from small to great, and they did not kill anyone but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives, Anihum, the Jezreelites, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, and Carmelite, had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people were grieved. Every man for his son and his daughter, but David strengthened himself in the Lord, his God. And David said to Abithar, the priest, Abimelech's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abithar brought the ephod to David. Now watch this. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them without fail and recovery of all. Now this story is very significant because it really paints a picture of a lot of us what we've went through. Imagine if you would, you just got saved to the church and, and you're excited about serving and, and blessing people and so you get involved and, and while you're at church being involved one day, someone breaks into your house and a fire breaks out and your house is burnt down. So when you return from church, you look at the house and you say, Lord, why did you let this happen? I've given my life to you. I'm serving in you. Why is this door open? And, and all of a sudden, the thoughts begin to hit your mind. Why is God letting this to happen to me? And these little voices are saying, see, when you serve God, you don't get the best. David was in a similar situation, and his was grave as well because of the fact that he had led his men out to battle. He said, I'm following God. Follow me. And he'd let him out. And I know when he probably came back and saw the smoke coming up and, and all the families gone and his wife and, you know, and them gone as well, that his heart began to sink deep and he began to beat himself up and feel guilty about what he did. Maybe I shouldn't have let him out. Maybe I should have stayed around town because I know if we would have been here, they never would have come in and destroyed our town and taken our children and wives. And what are they doing to my wife right now? What are they doing to so-and-so's wife right now? And so I imagine guilt... The voice of guilt began to hit David over and over and over again. But he does something very significant. He builds himself up in the Lord. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Because when you're in a battle, if you get weak in your faith, the battle will overtake you. But God doesn't leave us that way. There's a way that we can get built up so that we're strong in the battle and we can overcome. And some of you are here with a great battle that you're facing right now. And I'm telling you that you can get built up in the Lord and you can overcome. David did that, and then he inquired of the Lord, and, and this is very, very significant. Because during the time that David uh, said this, or had this event happen, the will of the Lord had not been fully revealed to the extent that it would be later revealed through the Psalms. In other words, when David had this happen in his life, there wasn't a revelation in the word that said, Many are the affliction of the righteous, but the Lord shall deliver you out of all of them. That was something that David learned by the Spirit as he went through life. This Bible is progressive revelation, and I'm so excited about it that God just didn't give, give us the first chapter and said, figure out the rest on your own. He kept speaking from one generation to the next generation. Every time he spoke, he began to bring the Word of God more clear and more defined. David was in a situation where he didn't know if it was God's will to retrieve all. But I'm telling you here by the authority of the scripture that it is God's will for you to recover everything that has been taken from you. It's God's will that nothing be lost. It's God's will that you go over the top. It's God's will. Can you say amen, everybody? Amen. So there are voices that tell you that it's not going to work out, that you know, maybe this is the way it's supposed to be. But David, he inquired of the Lord, and the Lord said, Pursue, you will recover all in your life. You know, voices. When I think of voices, I think of people primarily. And we know that Satan uses people. 
If you remember Peter, who was definitely in love with Jesus, was even used by the devil. And one time he was rebuking Jesus about going to the cross, and Jesus recognized it and said, get behind me, Satan. Called one of his friends Satan, because he recognized Satan was using his voice. But I believe there's also voices that are spoken through circumstances that are demonic. Remember when Jesus spoke to the fig tree? It says that he answered the tree. What do you mean? Is the fig tree talking to you? Yes, it was. When he reached for that fruit, there was no fruit there. And it's like the tree is saying, I'm not going to provide for the Son of God today. And Jesus spoke back because of it. And you may be in a situation right now where your circumstances are speaking to you and saying, you can't do this because of what you did in the past. You can't be what God called you to be because of the mistakes that you made in the past. You can't do it because you're not smart enough, you're not good looking enough, you don't got enough money, you can't do this. You may be hearing those voices right now and I'm telling you that you, you, can, you can never give in to those voices. You gotta fight in faith for the things that God's promised you. You just can't afford to do it. There's a story told of a missionary whose father had passed away I'm not sure what continent it was, but it was definitely a third world country. And so the daughter of this man says, okay, we're going to bury my father. And she was preparing to bury the father. And two rainmakers, or we'd call them witch doctors, came to her and said, listen, we want you to pay us and also sacrifice a goat or we're going to pray that it's going to rain on your father's funeral. And the woman got caught a little bit by surprise and she jerks back and she says, don't you know who I am? And they said, well, who are you? She says, I am a child of the king and I have dominion over you and everything you do. And they walked away storming mad. And they went off and began to do their spells and whatever they do and the weather began to change. Horrible storm breaks out on the funeral day. But what was strange about it is where the fu funeral was being done, there was no rain clouds. The sun was shining through, and they were able to bury her father. But you could look around, and you could see outside of where they were at, and there were clouds, and it, it was raining severely. And it rained so hard that it created flash floods, and the flash floods drowned the two rainmakers. <laughs> but there's these voices that tell us you can't get well. They tell you she'll never be the same. They tell you that it won't work out. Never give in to anyone's voice unless it's the Spirit of God or the Word of God. Because Satan knows the only way that he can defeat you is by eliminating your faith. The Bible says fight the good fight of faith. It doesn't say to fight another way. A lot of people are fighting by lowering their standards. A lot of people are fighting by compromise. A lot of people are fighting by human reasoning to accomplish their dreams. When God said, I don't want you to use human reason. I don't want you to use your own understanding. I want you to use my understanding. I don't want you to lower the standard. I want you to keep my standard up and I want you to accomplish it by my word, by my power, because you believe in it. Let me work on your behalf. But the way you get people to stop sinning is to unplug the power to sin. And if you use guilt, condemnation, and shame, all you, do is, all you do is empower it. And even though they may say no to it, it'll pop up somewhere else. And there'll be those Christians that are Christians on Sunday and live like the devil on Monday that have two kinds of lives. Only when you're free are you free indeed. Jesus said, to whom the Son has made free is free indeed. I'm free to live right. 
I'm free to believe God. I'm free to receive his blessing. I'm free to overcome. I'm free to be more than a conqueror. I'm free. Come on, I'm free. I'm free. Woo, man. There's a difference between conviction and being convinced by the Holy Spirit. Conviction only works with condemnation, guilt, and shame. Being convinced by the Spirit works from God's goodness. Where God opens your eyes and you go, oh, Lord, now I see it. It's different than being under conviction. When God saved me, I had just smoked a joint. And his voice spoke to me. And he didn't mention anything about smoking pot. He just revealed himself to me. And I wasn't high after, as soon as he spoke. Everything changed. Now I got up and walked over a Bible because he, he said, I want you to go read that Bible. And I opened it up and it was in Proverbs. I read it. And as I read it, the Holy Spirit began to open my eyes. Only God would know that about people. Only God would know that about people. Only God would know that about people. Jesus never used condemnation to reveal he was Messiah to anybody. You remember the woman at the well? She had been divorced five times. Even in our day, that's a pretty good record. And she's living with somebody. And Jesus offers her eternal life. He didn't say, if you get your life together, then I'll give you eternal life. No, so I'll give you your eternal life right now. And, and then he says this, because he wants her to convince her that he's the real deal. He says, you know, bring your husband. Well, I don't have a husband. She says, well, you've spoken truly. You've actually been divorced five times, and you're living with someone now. And she walked away. He's the Messiah. He's a prophet. He's the real deal. God knows that condemnation will keep you going back to pornography. It'll infuel your pride. It will cause you to live wrong. And you can be as strong as you can in your willpower, and you'll always go back to it. It's only when, you're, when you remove that condemnation and you realize that God loves you, not based on what you do and what Jesus did, and all of a sudden you realize, Lord, I can get all I need from you to do what I need to do. If you told me to, to quit this, I can quit this. If you told me to quit drinking, I can lay it down, praise God, because you're walking in his righteousness and his power. Come on, church. So you might be in that situation where the voices are getting to you and you're really concerned about it. Never, never give in to guilt. Never, never give in to guilt. Never, never give in to guilt. Turn to Christ. Turn to Christ. Don't give in to guilt and shame and condemnation. Because you'll be a less of a person. For a woman, they'll be intimidated. They'll be controlled by those around them. They'll give their husband an a, a opportunity to control them. They'll give their boss an opportunity on their job to control them. Men, same thing is true with you. Being insecure, any fear like that, your boss will take advantage of you. Because the devil will always take advantage of someone who has got fear in their life. What we need to do is reestablish our belief. Believe first, then act. Believe first, then act. Believe first, then act. Don't act first. Believe first, then act. It makes a difference. Let me show you balance this. Look in Galatians chapter 5, and I'll show you this. How many have heard of Christian liberty? Let me tell you what Christian liberty is not, and then I'll tell you what it is. Look what it says. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Keep going. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. I testify again to you that every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. Now what he's saying here is this. I want you to stand in the liberty of Christ. What's the liberty of Christ? 
The liberty of Christ is I want you to stand in what Christ has done for you on the cross. I want you to stand in the fact that you've been delivered from condemnation. Standing in Christ's liberty doesn't mean standing in sin. It means that you're standing in the righteousness of God that God gave you. You're standing in the fact that you have been seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You're standing in the fact that you've been forgiven of all your sins, past, present, and future. So there's nothing controlling you in your life. Condemnation is not controlling you. Fear is not controlling you. Shame is not controlling you. The only thing that is controlling you is Jesus Christ. Say amen, everybody. But as soon as you go back under a law, instead of staying under the law of love, which is, fulfills everything that is, that is wrong, it takes you way over the top of it. My friend, I want you to see this and grab hold of this. That liberty is not an excuse to sin. When you are free, you're free indeed. Let me show this to you with kids. And I'm not going to give this illustration implying that you shouldn't discipline kids. But when you discipline a kid, what do you do? If you do that, I'm going to spank you. So the kid doesn't do it because he's afraid if he does it, he'll be punished. Right? You can't train a child by that only. Because when you're not looking, he'll do it. If he can get away with it, he'll do it. So the child's always got the condemnation and guilt in their life. And as long as they have that in their life, they'll always look for a way to get away with it when they don't get punished. But when, what you need to do is take your child and bring them to Jesus. When you come to Jesus, Jesus forgives your sins. Something happened. When you come to Jesus, Jesus forgives you of all your sins. And you are free now. You don't have that influence of condemnation and guilt to get you to want to sin when no one's watching and you're really free. When Jesus said you're free indeed, it says you're free not to watch pornography. You're free to treat your wife right. You're free to be able to forgive. You're free to take on mountains. You're free to accomplish God's will in your life. That's what freedom is. Freedom is not being in bondage to something. If you're in bondage to eating, in bondage to lust, in bondage to pride, then you're not free. But when you are free in Christ, you're free from all the condemnation that fuels those things. And when you get free from that, you are blessed. Now look at this next verse, uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 21, quickly. Is the law then against the promise of God? Certainly not, for if they had been the law given, which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. Now, before I go on, what is he saying? He's saying that if there's any way that you could be saved by law, God would have done it. But now he explains why he couldn't do that. Next verse. But the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. In other words, God couldn't allow us to be saved by a law because all of us have sinned. You would have to be perfect before you did the law and then you'd have to do the law perfectly to be saved. And because no one is perfect, God said the only way they're going to get saved is if they have faith in Jesus Christ. He's the only one that is perfect. He's the only one that was out without sin. Amen. Say amen, everybody. Amen. You can't transform your life by laws. You transform it by turning to Christ. He removes the condemnation in your life, and then you operate in the law of love or the perfect law of liberty. When you love in that way, you won't steal from someone. When you love according to the law of love, according to Christ, you're not going to commit adultery. You follow what I'm saying? You don't need a law. You're looking at the love that God gave you. And when you look at the love that Jesus gave you and start responding to it, you don't need a law because you're not going to break any laws because I'm walking in the law of liberty. It is, the it is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that has set me free from the law of sin and 
death. It was when I came to Jesus and he loved me the way that I was. He loved me in my fallen state. He said, you don't got to do anything. Just believe on me. And if you believe on me, I'll remove all that condemnation and guilt in your life. And you'll be free indeed. You'll be able to do what I told you to do. You won't be in bondage to this anymore in your life. Join us at the River on Wednesdays and Sundays for weekly services, as well as great programs for kids, youth, and young adults. Visit riveroflifefellowship.org to view our calendar of events. There's something for everyone at the River, where family matters.